Thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, this is the short infrastructure talks. Um, we have four short talks um, and uh, we'll save questions for after uh, um, all talks have gone. Uh, so our first talk is uh, by Brian Schilder, our workflows taming the wild west of our packages. All right. Thanks everyone for waiting. And uh, I'm gonna be presenting some of our lab's work on our workflows. Um, I'm a PhD student at Imperial College London, and I'm in the group of uh, Dr. Nathan Skeen. So let's start with a simple question. How many R packages are there? A um, couple thousand, a couple hundred? Well, actually, it's upwards of at least over 50,000 um, of the ones that are publicly accessible. So that's a lot. So how are these packages, packages distributed to users? Well, if you gather data across all repos, including our OpenSci, CRAN, Bioconductor, RForge, um, and GitHub, you find that over 50% of all our packages are now exclusively distributed through GitHub. And this is in large part due to the ability to install directly from GitHub with the remotes package and the install GitHub function. But don't get me wrong, I love GitHub. Um, it's awesome and I think everyone should use it for at least some kind of version control system like it. Um, but there's some things that you're probably aware of. Um, Namely, that uh, just because code is on GitHub doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be installable, that it works, or that it's going to work in the future. So how does this play out in the real world? Um, so let's take the example of the R package FUBAR. It was just published by Eastwood et al. in the esteemed and reputable journal, journal Signatures. Um, a completely hypothetical thing. <laughs> and now let's say you see this publication and think this is exactly what I need for my project. It foos all the bars and it outperforms all <laughs> previous tools. However, when you go to do it um, and you actually try to uh, run this, you find there's some issues. Um, first, you have some difficulties with installing it. So you go back and forth with developers, to try and work that out. Eventually you get it installed, but you run to the next issue um, that there's very minimal or no documentation and the examples they do provide don't really work as is. Um, and finally, you get the package running on some example data, but you find it's throwing some cryptic errors when you actually go to run it on your data set. And this goes uh, on for several weeks to months and finally you decide you can't sink any more time into this no matter how good the signatures paper says it is. Um, so this leaves us with an important question. Um, with so many R packages out there, over half of which are now distributed only on GitHub, how do users assess which tools are going to work as advertised before they actually invest the time in it? Well, some options. We could convince everyone to submit their packages to CRAN, Bioconductor, and our open side. But I think that's fairly unlikely um, and not necessarily appropriate for every package. Um, we keep playing Russian roulette with GitHub only packages, um, which includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, or we as a community could provide tools to make continuous integration as easy and mutually beneficial as possible. And for those who don't know, Continuous integration is essentially a framework in which developers can make a change to their software, push it to some repository, launch automatic checks, and just continue this cycle so that they know that their package is working as intended. And fortunately, GitHub um, launched a native solution a couple of years ago called GitHub Actions, and it's uh, gotten a lot of widespread usage. And um, this really is nice because you don't have to have any external uh, services or anything. It's all free within GitHub. So let me first like to make a distinction between workflows and actions. It's kind of confusing, but it's an important one. Um, so workflows are static YAML files, which you include in your GitHub repository when you push it. And um, 
they will basically list all of the things you want to do, install, check, whatever else. Um, but there's no version control, um, doesn't all provide any usage stats, and you have to duplicate those files within every repo for every user. Um, this is in contrast to actions, which are basically centrally maintained versions of workflows. So you just call the action um, and they're completely version controlled and you do get some usage stats as far as who's actually implementing them. So just a quick timeline of what this has uh, looked like in the, our development community. Um, there's been some attempts to really capitalize on GitHub Actions within uh, our packages. And this includes Use This, which writes a series of separate workflow scripts to define the code checking tasks. Um, you also have BIOC Actions, which are a series of centrally maintained actions uh, that are separate. Um, and then BIOC This, um, which basically distributes a series of workflow scripts via an R package. Um, and then finally, what I'll be focusing on today is our workflows, which merges many sub actions into one action that is standardized and centrally maintained, it means that users never have to even touch the YAML scripts. And uh, whenever there's a problem um, and it gets fixed um, by our team, it is immediately propagated to anyone who uses our action. So how does it actually work? Well, first you need an R package. If you have one already, great. You don't need to do anything. Um, but if you are starting a new one, you can use um, template R, which is intended to basically automate a lot of the documentation processes by pulling information from the description and filling it throughout all the relevant markdown files, vignettes, things like that. Um, if you have an R package that you've already created, you can add the R workflows, a uh, short workflow script, which basically just calls the R workflows action. Um, the only thing that you need to do is run the function use workflow with all the defaults, and it will automatically infer um, logical defaults and uh, write everything for you. Um, there's 24 different parameters you can change uh, to change how it gets triggered, where it's launched, uh, which platforms it's launched on, um, so it's very customizable, but it works right out of the box. And then finally, once you make your changes and push them to GitHub, uh, your um, our workflows action gets automatically triggered and runs all of the things which I'm about to show you. So first of all, it creates uh, virtual machines on three different machines, Linux, Mac, Win Mac and Windows. It will install all the system dependencies, R dependencies. It will run CRAN and or bioconductor checks. It's up to you. Um, and it will also run unit tests and give you code coverage reports. And let's say in this example, it doesn't run on the first uh, try on Windows. There's a bug. You check out the bug. Um, you fix it, make a push, and now it's uh, running on all three uh, platforms just fine. As a bonus, you get a lot of different uh, things you can automatically generate a Docker container with everything installed. It will push it to Docker Hub where people can then pull it um, without uh, having the need to actually install uh, any of the dependencies themselves. It will turn all of your Roxygen notes into a documentation website using package down and then launch them in GitHub pages. And it'll give you all of these badges um, on your readme, which will give you sort of a health report on your package. Uh, I'm going to just skip over this very quickly because I'm running out of time, but um, there's a lot of different parties that I think can benefit from this, including developers to run checks, um, even if you're on Bioconductor and CRAN, to make sure that things are working before you push upstream. Uh, assess package health for users who are trying to figure out what package they should be using and making installation easy. And also for reviewers to also assess package health and make things easier to install and test, making it more likely that they're actually going to test it and not just take the, uh, the writer's word for it, which can happen sometimes. Um, people are starting to use it, even though I haven't really officially advertised it yet, and um, more than happy to take community feedback. I've also provided some tutorials um, in collaboration with uh, several other people in this group. Um, 
in the future, we'd like to use more official sub actions, uh, have sort of meta actions to check the health of our action, um, promote this more through different mechanisms. I'm also making pull requests to high impact repositories that are used a lot uh, for different R packages so that it gets, um, has a larger impact. And then finally, uh, uh, try to procure some long-term support from, Bio from Bioconductor and the R4 team, ideally. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, take any questions afterwards. I try and just give you a minute let me figure out how to <laughs> go to the next slide uh, uh, what is this you know, I go to the next slide I don't know how to go to the next slide <laughs> is it, um, oh, I think they're in the Chrome browser they're in the Chrome browser okay. yeah they're on Google Drive there and I think you can either open it there for the ones that are already converted to Google Slides. Let's go back here. Yeah, the far right side there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. <coughs> okay. All right, so our next presenter is uh, Klein Liu, enabling reusable and reproducible genomic data management and analysis in R. Thank you. Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Chen Liu. I'm currently an um, assistant professor in uh, the Department of uh, Statistics and Bioinformatics at Roswell Park Comprehensive, uh, <laughs> uh, Roswell Park, uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, thank you for the conference organizer for giving me this opportunity to present my work on enabling reusable and reproducible genomic data management and analysis in R. So first, to give you some simple background about the current status of data analysis. So typical data ana analytics will uh, include two main parts, the data preprocessing part, the data cleaning, and the uh, data modeling part for the statistical analysis. So for example, if we have a whole genome sequencing data, we need to do some QC first and map the data to the reference genome, and we do some variant calling. So these are usually based on the command line tools, such as uh, FastQC, BWA, or GPK. But after uh, we get a set of candidate variants, we may do some further analysis, such as the variant annotations uh, to annotate the functions and variant filtering. So these are many uh, are very common use uh, based on our bioconductor packages. So there are many command line tools we be involved in the preprocessing step, uh, which makes them uh, many reproducibility issues such as the software installation conflicts. So in order to improve the reproducibility, there are many challenges. First, people work on diverse computing environments and their complex software dependencies, especially in the preprocessing steps where uh, a lot of uh, command line tools are included. Workflow language will present a solution to these challenges. They combine different mathematics tools to accomplish specific data uh, analysis tasks, and they use the data management software, such as Belconda and the Docker, to continuize those uh, software tools uh, to solve those reproducibility issues. Uh, for example, the common workflow language has been very widely used in different projects, consortiums, and uh, comp uh, cloud computing platforms. So with all the conveniences and uh, functionalities of workflow language, there are some intrinsic challenges. So first, they are uh, command line based languages, and you need to learn it. Um, with a, with a non-trivial learning curve, and it doesn't connect well with the downstream statistical analysis tools such as the R-Bell conductor. So in order to address these challenges, uh, we have developed two packages, RSWL and RSWL pipelines. They are intended to connect the pre-processing step and modeling steps uh, all using the, these two R packages to represent uh, our bell conductor tool chain for reproduce bioinformatics pipelines. Uh, first, uh, we chose one of the very commonly used workflow language 
CWL and wrote a robust and scalable RBEL conductor interface. And based on that, we have a catalog of uh, like more than 200 commonly used and emerging bioinformatics tools into the reproducible RCWL pipelines. So basically, users will start with the RCWL pipeline uh, package. You can search and uh, load the tool into the R uh, session so that they can be evaluated very conveniently within R. And also, they provide uh, functionalities for developers to build your own tool, like in your specific research area. And you're welcome to contribute to the R style pipelines so that this be shared with all the other researchers. So here I use one example of using the STAR to index a reference genome in three ways. So the first is the traditional way, and also I show you the CWL way and the RCWL way as, uh, for a comparison. Basically, traditionally you need to download and compile the software first, and then you will uh, write an on-premise batch script to define the inputs, outputs, and connect uh, different um, batch scripts to connect different tools. And if you work on the HPC, you need to configure the workload management. So uh, there will be many potential issues, for example, the software in, uh, installation issues. And also, uh, once installed, the software might not be properly checked for its version and source. And also, you need to, um, the, the, whole pers the inputs and outputs are hard coded to the scripts and uh, you have to wait until the first tool to finish and manually pass the output to the next tool so which makes the whole process um, time consuming and error prone oh, so this uh, comp workflow language solves most of these issues first you write a uh, stable scripts and you uh, specify the base command uh, the requirements inputs and outputs here it uh, pulls a Docker image of a specific version of the software tool, so which solves the software installation issues efficiently. And also, they can connect uh, different tools by passing the inputs and outputs automatically, so which makes the whole process more efficient. And also, then you write a YAML file to assign values for the raw uh, inputs, and then you get all the results by running a uh, script to a CWL runner for the last step, you have to download and install the CWL runner. So as you can see, it's very useful and convenient to streamline your data analysis workflows. Uh, it does involve much work and expertise. Alternatively, you can try our CWL pipelines. So basically, you can just uh, uh, install the package, assign values as you do uh, in R and you can submit the whole uh, the you can submit the tool recipe in R uh, to run the whole CWL script so it's internally submitted as a CWL script but you don't need to worry about a runner because they are all built in so I would say we now have like more than 200 pre-built tools and uh, recipes tools and workflows that are more commonly used bioinformatics tools, which are ready to be queried and uh, used directly in R. If you are more of R person, I want to take advantage of the workflow language and uh, keep everything from beginning to the end inside R. I recommend you to try this. We also provide functionalities for, you, for developers to build their own tools and recipes. So on our project website, rcwl.org, we have listed uh, like all the available pipelines and uh, which comes with separate pages for each of the pipelines. So uh, it'd be helpful to browse this website before you dive into our package. Uh, we have um, successfully, successfully applied rcwl on different cloud computing platforms uh, with different working environments. Okay, as a summary, I, I do have further slides. <laughs> as a summary for the uh, previous section, so here we present RCWL and RCWL pipelines as an R interface for the uh, CWL. Well, it integrates tools uh, that are previously based on command line 
interface and also our diagnostic packages and the internal implementation and use of virtual language and software uh, management of, uh, tools for the reproducibility. So next time you quickly produce another package called reuse data. Uh, so when we do the data analysis, we have experiment data, which is the main part, and we also need to use the reusable genomic data, such as the reference genome, which are mainly used in our DNA or RNA sequencing data analysis. So they will be repeatedly used in different um, projects. So uh, here we focus on this topic to how to effectively manage these files. So uh, similarly, if you use it uh, traditionally, you need to download the data and do some data curation, such as indexing a reference genome. Uh, and then you uh, save a copy of the indexed reference genome to your local computer, and um, then you can use them on different situations. Uh, there can be many challenges. The data can be uh, disordered, hard to find, and, uh, <clears throat> and even redundant. Uh, if they are not properly checked for the version and source, uh, especially if you work in a uh, informatics core facility, different people may use the same um, uh, genomic resources. There have been multiple copies. And uh, for many different projects, you need to pre-process this data, which can be uh, very inefficient and uh, there'll be a waste of computing resources. So uh, the reuse data is aiming to improve the data reusability and reproducibility for the reusable genomic data analysis. So basically, we have reimagined those two recipes as we presented in our study of pipelines to make them more data uh, centered for data processing and uh, reproducible generation of those reproducible purity data and uh, make them as a data recipe. So essentially, they are multiple um, tools may be involved for the data processing. So essentially the data recipe is uh, like workflow uh, recipe in RCW pipelines and uh, but they with some adding um, added function with some added uh, handling of the meta information about this data. So once the data uh, are reproducibly generated by the get data function, uh, they can be safely shared with your lab mates, with your other researchers and they can be applied on your local uh, data analysis, even cloud computing platforms. So the steps will be easy because we have previewed some uh, commonly used data recipes. For example, the a leftover uh, file from Ensemble. Then you can just search and uh, <clears throat> load the load the data recipe into your R session, and you can evaluate the data recipe using the get data function. So uh, there will be some uh, automatically generated meta files to go with the data so that it will be easy to query uh, using the data search function. We can use some keywords uh, to search the data once the, the local cache is built. And uh, they can also be converted into different like standardized formats to be used uh, is uh, to be used in R or other uh, workflow language like scripts. So we have a list of all the previewed uh, data recipes, such as the, the ensemble list that we're over here. And uh, we have the separate pages for each of the data recipes, but they may serve as a template for you to build your own uh, data recipe for your own data management. So as a summary, hope I'm not being um, over too much. So here we presented uh, three file conductor tools, the RCWL pipelines, RCWL, and reuse data to represent a uh, file conductor tool chain for reusable and reproducible genomic data management and analysis. And we have all the support uh, uh, materials available on our website, rcwl.org. Then uh, you can just feel free to ask any questions to my email on the back of the next course guide and etc. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Vaughn. We're just two of the next sessions.
Next we have uh, JRM uh, Kancherla. Did I say it right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, BioC Pi enabling bioconductor workflows in Python. All right, thank you. Let me see how this works. All right, so I'm Jerem Cancella. I'm a research software engineer at Genentech uh, within Michael Lawrence's group and also Hector Corona Bravo. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about enabling bioconductor workflows in Python. But before I talk about that, let me get a raise of hands in the audience on how many folks use Python or have collaborators that use a different programming language other than you are, than you use. So I see a couple of people who raised hands, um, and that's that's a common scenario that we all run into because we follow where the methods are. And historically, that has been RM bioconductor for a lot of statistical analysis methods. Um, if there's an increasing number of folks that are using Python for both imaging and machine learning workflows. And maybe at some point, we'll see more Julia and JavaScript packages for interactive environments. And I'll show one of our own applications uh, where we target JavaScript as a scientific computing platform. But um, as we go across any of these uh, computational environments, the data is always the common entity that, that is the key of all of this. So if we think about this problem, how do you make the data interoperable? There's, there's two parts of it, right? So one, you can, take, uh, you can take your data, convert it into a language agnostic representation that is intermediate um, and can be re read across different programming languages, or you can save your data objects as RDS files and magically read them in other programming languages. But there's two problems to either of these um, directions. So one, um, can we do we have appropriate data structures in Python to load these um, to load genomic data, genomic experimental data, and also um, can we read RDS serialized RDS files in languages other than R? Um, so I'll talk about I'll talk about uh, the first direction and some of our efforts in making um, data sets language agnostic. So something we recently open sourced at Genentech is our data platform called ArtifactDB. So it is a cloud-based data storage solution. Um, so if you have a file and you have metadata related to it, you can store it in ArtifactDB. Um, and it provides a lot of the functionality that you expect from a from a data platform, which is you know tasking these validations. Uh, it provides versioning, access control, and and many of the uh, functionalities. But what Aaron has done is um, he has taken a lot of the commonly represented genomic um, classes, for example, summarized experiment or MAEs, and has written serialization packages that would convert this data into language agnostic format, and then you can store them to to our or to artifact to a platform like artifact to So then the question really is um, so now that you can store these data sets in language agnostic format, can you load them in Python or languages other than R? And this is where um, there's been several efforts to bring BioC like representations to, to Python. Uh, but one of the problems with that is the user experience is fragmented and the the classes themselves are not interoperable with each other. And this is where we rely heavily on what Bioconductor has done and then take the part of Bioconductor. Uh, so we started implementing some of the BioC classes in Python. This includes, I think a lot of the audience here are very familiar with some of these. They go all the way from sequencing. Um, so BioStrings to handling multiple multi-assay experiments uh, in um, in Python, and that's where BioC Pi uh, comes into place. It's it's an effort to bring bioconductor data structures to Python. Um, it's to align these classes with bioconductor and artifact DB representations. It provides interoperability between R and Python, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides. But it, but um, it also provides a strong support for interval-based operations. So if you have genomic ranges or range summarized experiments you can expect the same behavior as what R provides in Python as well. And the initial goal is to not completely reinvent the wheel, but also take advantage of what Python already provides in terms of some of the popular packages like NumPy and SciPy from handling tens of past matrices and also pandas for the frames or polars, for example, is getting popular these days. Um, something we were very conscious when we were when we are building the initial set of the BIOS, the Python classes is uh, make sure that the usability of these packages is consistent between when folks switch across languages. For example, if you want to use, if you want to calculate flanking regions in our bioconductor, there's a flank function with um, a set of set of arguments. And the Python, it's it looks almost the same, except you know, you're now in an object-oriented paradigm, so it's the, the object dot function. 
Um, so what's in BioSeed Pi today? Um, there's a number of classes that provide similar behavior. So this includes genomic ranges, summarized experiments, and all its derivatives, MAEs, uh, and some of the stuff that we're currently working on that, that tries to bring a lot more support for, um, and that tries to bring a lot more support for some of the classes that are much needed in Python. Uh, there's a few helper functions as well, um, helper packages and our functions that tries to uh, simplify some of your analysis workflows. So how do you get started? Um, it's as simple as installing the install by C5. It's just, usually, it's just mostly a wrapper package to install a lot of the core packages, but you're also free to install the individual packages themselves. Um, so a quick demo of how genomic ranges works. Um, uh, just a quick note that the intervals are inclusive on both the ends and they start at one because it doesn't make sense to have a genomic position at zero. Uh, and the way you import a genomic range object is um, usually if you have tab, if you're represented in a tabular format, uh, which is very commonly a panacea frame in Python, uh, you can load that as a genomic range object. It must contain um, some, there's some expectations on uh, tabular data, so it must contain columns like seek name, start and end, so that we know how the intervals are stored. Or um, there's also many of the helper functions to load genomic annotations from UCSC. Uh, but overall, um, once you load the data, you get a genome object back, and there's several methods that are available um, on these to perform uh, interval arithmetic. For example, if you want to do search operations, set operations, or any of that. I'm going to quickly go through some of these slides in the interest of time, so the next speaker has time. Uh, but you know, feel free to check out the BioCPy for a lot of the packages and the classes that we have. This documentation and tests for all of this. The way the the the, were, the the way the development was done is, you know, we I took all the tests that are currently in the R package, implement them and move them to Python, and then start implementing them so that we have consistent behavior between these languages. And we're not, you know, showing um, we don't have obvious bugs or anything. Anyway, so I'm going to skip this one. So that's the 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 first direction. So so, so far we have representations in Python that can load genomic data sets, but can we do a more native way of reading these RDS, some of these RDS files that we have around data plane Python. And this is where um, Aaron has really spent a lot of time, painstakingly spent a lot of time trying to write a C++ patch, package called RDS to CPP. And what really differentiates this package from other similar uh, packages is it can read S4 classes. And that really provides us the ability to read bioconductor classes um, in languages other than R. So uh, what I've done on top of that RDS to CPP is this write a wrapper called RDS to Pi, uh, which is a Python package. And as you can see on the snippet on the right, you read your, your RDS file in Python um, after loading the package, of course. And then you can, you can uh, load it as a summarized experiment. I think that object is a summarized experiment. And you get a summarized experiment class in Python back. Um, so uh, Aaron has also went through and uh, and gone through the way of writing uh, objects back as RDS files. That's not currently part of RDS to Py, that, but that will be cool. So a lot, all, all of these efforts come together in this use case for single cell analysis. Uh, what Aaron has also done along the way has he has done he has written low-level C++ packages for a lot of the analytical methods that go for processing single cell data. Um, so you can use the same code in R. Um, and we started writing some of the bindings for a lot of these packages in Python. But also uh, with the with the increasing use of WebAssembly as a platform and browser as a platform for scientific computing, we also compile that to JavaScript and, and we have a nice application called Kana. So ideally, the goal is, you know, you can start your analysis in R, save the object as RDS file, you can go back to Python, run some machine learning workflows, and then save it back as RDS file, and then go to the browser called Kana, and then explode the results of the data sets. And so it provides a, a way of doing this iterative um, analysis of single cell data. Uh, finally, um, you know, if it's too long, uh, I think if we, it, it's important that we all write our methods in C++. So you can reuse this code in a in a lot of other programming languages. Um, there's a GitHub organization for BioCPy, uh, so go check it out and look at all the classes. But feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in contributing, or if you have any suggestions or feedback. 
Uh, there's also a JavaScript version of some of the Bioconnector classes. So that's, um, Aaron has written that, um, called Bioconnector.js. Um, and special thanks to Aaron because, you know, he's the more prolific C++ programmer that I know. And also Michael and Hacker for all the help and support. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So let me just set up for the last, our last speaker. Is this it? Okay. 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 I just tried. Okay. Okay. So our last speaker is Stefano Mangiolo. We've curated Atlas Query, an interface for querying across curated cell atlases. Thank you. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, everybody. So this is a project that was uh, became public at the beginning of the, this year, and um, it, it responds a bit to the this abundance of single cell uh, data that has been. Um, you know, became real with the Human Cell Atlas. So Human Cell Atlas is this consortium <clears throat> which main goals are to define all human cell types and as well build their reference map of the human body. And uh, yes, the promise and it, what he's achieving is to um, publish 100 million cells across 45 tissue in the human body. And um, just to introduce, the, uh, there is an uh, infrastructure called Cell by Gene, which <coughs> incorporates some of this data, and in the future, I imagine all of it, and provides a good uh, visual infrastructure to, for the user to explore the data, um, mildly analyze it, and download some data sets of interest. Uh, so the goal for this project was to also give the opportunity to user uh, to use an interface in R where they can um, explore data at a single cell level and uh, download it for analysis. And I won't talk today in this inter interest of time, but we use this uh, infrastructure to build the uh, immune body map um, at the tissue level. And uh, the areas of impact are many of these all endeavor of the human cell atlas and these infrastructures is can help precision medicine obviously have a, having a um, good understanding of the variability of the tissue biology at the population level, demographic level is very important. Uh, immune therapy, as <coughs> we are trying to do, um, having a very good idea of whether an immune target is present uh, across demographic aging and tissues is also very important. Uh, so what we did is to collect 30 million cells from the curated, uh, from the uh, cell by gene repository. Uh, again, uh, includes many tissues and build a R interface that allow you easily to explore the data as a table, filter the data, for example, CD40 cells across tissues for young individuals and collect this data uh, in different uh, containers for analysis. And uh, now it's quite easy to Take your favorite genes, your favorite cell type, and plot for every cell. Here is a dot and color by uh, data set, uh, gene expression, for example, across diseases um, or across tissues. Or uh, it's quite straightforward to do calculations about immune infiltration in tissues according with um, age, sex, ethnicity, and, and um, much more. So in these big data sets, uh, so far are present roughly 700 prenatal, 1,000 uh, pre-adult and 10,000 adult sample. And um, this data set is uh, obviously quite complex in terms of organization as a hierarchical aspect to it. Uh, for example, we have many tissues. Generally speaking, each tissue is um, contributed by more than one data set. For example, different studies from different laboratories. And uh, a data set is contributed by many samples. Uh, of course, each sample includes many cell types. And each sample is characterized by uh, different um, properties such as ethnicity, age, sex, uh, technology, and so on. Um, so these, these all collections of data set was produced without a specific design in, in mind. Is, is really a collection. So um, analyzing these data sets uh, 
some biases uh, um, appear quite obvious. For example, if you represent here, each dot is a sample and yellow color represents a lot of data sets. Um, and uh, we distribute on uh, ethnicity on the y-axis and, and uh, disease on the x. We see that the first column, which is healthy tissue, has already quite strong uh, European bias. And this bias become bigger as uh, we across diseases. You can see this big white gap here. And in our paper, we make the case that um, you know we start to we need to start to think about design of data collection as community uh, if we want a precision medicine that will be more applicable to everybody. And um, age is very powerful uh, data in this uh, collection, as uh, we have a overall a very wide spectrum from zero to 80 plus years old. But also here we can see there are quite a lot of biases uh, through ethnicity again. Some ethnicities have uh, huge age coverage, some other not so much, and also across tissues. So for example, prostate sample tend to be obviously uh, available at a later um, age. And uh, uh, well, the, this is quite important if we want to model statistically uh, this data with the multi-level models also to model these biases. Although today I won't talk about that. Uh, just to mention what curation uh, pipeline uh, we use to provide this interface that I will very soon uh, show in, as a code example. So we use a cell by gene DP uh, biconductor package, which provide a very um, convenient way to download this data um, as at the data set level. What we did is to harmonize all this data set to be queried all together at the single cell level. So um, we curated the metadata, for example, reverse engineer some of the sample IDs that every study defined in a different way with different naming. Um, we harmonize age that now is in days across these all 30 million cells. Um, cell type, we uh, curated especially the immune cell types. So uh, we um, added to the original cell type quite few reference-based um, annotations. And we took a consensus approach to provide a confident, confidence tier to cell types. For example, if your analysis requires high confidence of T cells or any other cell type, you can choose which tier you want. And we provide these uh, 30 million rows by roughly 50 columns as a DACDB, uh, which is, uh, can be easily explored and um, filtered and um, um, you know, manipulated without affecting too much the memory is very efficient on this side. And for the counts, also we have harmonized this in a positive real scale, and we provide a, on with the on disk um, technology uh, also uh, counts per million. And so both the metadata and the counts are stored in uh, the Australian data center here, and our package is interfaces with that. And all the data you, you download are cached. So obviously you don't, you don't download twice. So how is the interface? It's quite simple, just a couple of functions. You can call get metadata, which with no arguments will uh, link to, the, uh, to this repository. And you will get a DACDB table. Uh, and uh, you can do uh, many operations on it, explore it, uh, summarize it, and so on. For example, if you want to list all data sets per tissue, uh, we can use um, this DuckDB with um, tidyverse verbs. So if you like tidyverse, you basically won't need to learn anything about this, um, this infrastructure. Uh, we can filter, once we know what we want, we can filter the cells that we are interested in. You can see here ethnicity, uh, technology here uh, from a specific tissue and so on. And uh, so this filtering is quite powerful as it is with, uh, with dplyr. This is um, the, the backend is dbplyr. And we can uh, call get single cell experiments and we will get a single cell experiment uh, uh, again with on disk counts. Um, and to reproduce the plot I showed before when I was plotting 30 million cells, uh, well, not 30 million cells, but single cells of a specific cell type here we can filter NK cells, we can get uh, CPM for a specific gene. And in this case, I'm using a uh, tidy single cell experiment to use ggplot with this. And uh, that's the plot I was showing before with some more aesthetics, but that's the point. Alrighty, almost then. So it's worth to mention that uh, cell by gene 
is uh, developing currently uh, a census interface which overlaps in scope of the current scope we have with uh, curated Atlas query and has is not available yet, but this is their preview. It basically works similarly. You, you know, you load a linker and you use uh, some filters here. Here in this case are pre-established filters while we use uh, tidyverse um, grammar. Uh, but basically you can do the same thing. Uh, I, I have the feeling that our interface will be a bit more intuitive in terms of exploration and, and download, but we will see. And in this case, um, currently you can use, uh, load Surat object and are developing um, memory efficient capabilities, although they're not there yet. And there is a Python uh, actually development, which is more advanced than this. So as last slide, uh, where do we want to go from this? Uh, this our package has, uh, has been used by many, many users, uh, but with the current development of cell by gene, um, you know, which is the repository of the data, they are also developing the code infrastructure. Um, we could take a couple of paths. One is curation. So we could become a complementary resource to the official uh, cell by gene infrastructure. You can read some of the annotation we want to focus on and some of it we already produced for our studies and also expand the data. So go toward more disease specific data set incorporating cancer atlas and uh, COVID-19 atlases and so on. So this is a bit of uh, perspective. Uh, thank many people and thank you. Thanks to all of our presenters. Uh, I think we may don't, we, we don't have time for, for questions um, because the next session is going to be starting soon, but I encourage you to go and check out their work. Thanks, everyone. Quick question. I'm trying to take pictures.